Hey there, guys. All right, we're finally there. The Russian February Revolution of 1917. The Great War, week 137. Now, just as a reminder, I want to put this at the start of the video. Um, as I mentioned, a um, four days ago, Great War, week 136 at the beginning, I believe. Uh, and on Discord, I did get rear-ended. Uh, I... By the time I record, by the time I'm recording this, I still do not know. They have not come to pick up my car yet because it's the weekend, um, so I still do not know what the heck's gonna happen. So my my reactions are probably going to be rather lackluster because I just do not have the energy. But the YouTube algorithm gods will punish me if I do not keep uploading. I mean, they're already punishing me and not recommending my videos to anyone despite honestly good per video analytics like per video my videos are doing better than ever like y'all are watching my videos for longer um click through rate is average or always above average per video um most videos uh tend to do better than the previous one of them um so like uh, I don't know what else I'm supposed to do, YouTube. What the fuck do you want from me? Oh, I probably... Well, maybe swearing in the first two minutes of the video is not what I should be doing. Anyways. Yeah. Um, Remember to go and check out the links in the description box below. Kickstarter is live for my book. Um, Please do go and check out the Kickstarter link and go and read the prologue and first five chapters of my story. Uh, aside from that, let's go ahead and dive into the Russian February Revolution of 1917, which was actually in March because the Russians used you. Do they does Russia still use a different calendar, or or uh, have they changed it? I'm not sure. Let's dive in. What do you do when you can't get food? Um, die. When you can't afford to buy even the food that is available. When working conditions are intolerable. Well, if you're the Russian. Oh my god, sounds like the modern day right now. Russians, you hit the streets. Well, except for that part, because um No no one no one wants no one wants to get shot. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. Last week, French General Robert Nivelle proposed to take control of the British armies on the Western Front. The British were advancing there as the Germans fell back to the Hindenburg Line. They also advanced on the Tigris, taking Kut Alamara and setting their sights on Baghdad. The Serbian rebellion in Bulgarian-occupied Balkan territory continued, as did major U-boat sinkings at sea. The U.S. public found out about a German plot against them, and Austrian Army Chief of Staff Konrad von Hotzendorf lost his job. Woo! That was a busy week. Well, they're all busy weeks, and this one is no exception. There was more turmoil in Russia, for starters. This week, a strike began in the Putilov Munitions Works, which was the Russian army's main provider of ammunition. Also in Petrograd, food riots began that continued for days, with citizens in the streets demanding bread. By the 8th, there were 90,000 factory workers on strike. There were, in fact, food shortages in all the major cities. Agricultural production was down from so many farm workers being called to the army, and there were colossal distribution problems on the overstretched railway system. Inflation had soared, but wages remained the same, so the poor were being priced out of the market for any food that was available. The results were hunger, which caused food riots, and open political dissent that all blamed the Tsar for the suffering. More and more military units began to go over to the revolutionaries. A decade ago, the military had put down a revolution, but in 1917, the army had no enthusiasm or desire to fire on the people. The 8th was also International Women's Day, and the strikers were joined by those celebrating that occasion. So by the end yeah, of the week, 200,000 protesters were in the streets of Petrograd. The Tsar was completely isolated from all this and totally out of touch. This week, he wrote to his wife, Monarchy? Out of touch? With reality? The people that believe they have a divine right to rule? No way! 
that he was going to take up dominoes again, and in his diary that he was reading a French book about Julius Caesar's conquest of Gaul. It was the beginning of the end. I will say, the Tsar is a good-looking man, though. Like, the beard? A side note here. Nice. A while back, I talked about Interior Minister Alexander Protopopov, and it was a bit controversial. I will certainly bow to superior knowledge of the events and circumstances in Russia at this time, particularly about Protopopov and what he did or did not do. Many of you know far more about the subject than I do. I will say one thing further about him here, though. Now, I only have this from one source, the story of the Great War. Make of that what you will. They claim that he deliberately had food trains to Petrograd halted in the provinces. And when everybody was on strike, the two labor leaders who supported the Duma made an appeal for the workers to go back to work, but he had the appeal censored. That source claims Protopopov was deliberately fomenting revolution so that during the crisis, a peace with the central powers could be made and the revolution put down by the army. Many of you have written that Protopopov was not capable of this kind of machination, and even I have described him as laughably incompetent. Hmm. Just putting it out there. There is one source that claims this is so. I am curious to hear your thoughts. Well, yes, people can be super incompetent, but um, sometimes dumbasses do have moments of genius. And it's not necessarily, like, the thing with Protopopov's plan isn't necessarily a big brain plan. I feel like it, it is a smart plan if you want to secure power, right? You encourage the rebellion so that you can then just put it fucking down brutally and easily with your veteran soldiers now that the war is over. You get... You get there there are so many benefit <laughs> benefits to it um you know you get to claim that you've brought an end to the war um you put down the rebellion your power is now secured because the more violent and eager uh, members of society are now dead or detained um or they see the revo revolution get brought down quickly and brutally uh maybe they no longer feel the urge to rebel um if pro but that encouragement of such a revolution you could also look at it as a bit of insanity perhaps um so uh yeah i don't maybe a little bit of paranoia with protopopov um yeah uh it's not Well, it's not like a super big brain plan. It's a smart plan, but not like, I don't know. I feel like it's not coming out of left field even for a dumbass. There was action in the Middle East this week as well. The British were pursuing the Ottomans up the Tigris River, heading for Baghdad. On the 6th, British cavalry were 20 kilometers from the goal. On the 8th, the Tigris was bridged and the Ottomans driven from positions 10 kilometers from the city. The British also made a surprise crossing of the Diyala River. The Ottomans were actually also retreating en masse from Persia towards Baghdad, with the Russians in pursuit. This week, the Russians occupied Kangavar, south of Hamadan. In the Balkans, the Serbs' Toplitsa rebellion continued occupations of its own. The rebels took half a dozen small towns and were threatening the town of Vranja, which would be a big blow to the central powers if it fell. So the alarmed Austro-Hungarian and Bulgarian commands began to organize a counterattack. It would begin soon. And something else that could signal another beginning was the possibility that the U.S. might join the war. It's now been a month since diplomatic relations between the U.S. and Germany were severed. This week, President Woodrow Wilson took the oath of office to begin his second term as president. Boo. His inaugural speech reaffirms his commitment to armed neutrality. This is primarily in Fuck response Woodrow to Wilson. Germany's unrestricted submarine warfare policy which had sunk 500,000 tons of food bound for Britain in February alone. We've talked a lot about stuff dealing with the U.S. over the past few weeks, and I'd like to talk about something I haven't had time for yet, the Great Call-Up. In June 1916, the Great Call-Up, there had been a real possibility of war between the USA and Mexico. The U.S. Army had put together around 12,000 troops for its cross-border campaign. 
Uh, and we've talked about this before. But they need a lot more to show how serious the U.S. was about protecting the border. So they mobilized the entire National Guard. There was a plan for orderly mobilization, but rushing as many guardsmen to the border as quickly as possible was the order of the day. And by the end of July, there were 110,957 National Guardsmen at the border. There was a lot of confusion and a lot of problems. And I'll just briefly mention some of them here. Reluctance to serve was a big problem and the physical condition of the men another. The Surgeon General said, the large percentage of rejections at the muster in physical examination appears to the department surgeon as the most disappointing feature of the mobilization, indicating that the enlistment examinations had been nominal and superficial. And the Army's logistical system was overwhelmed. There weren't enough supplies for the guardsmen, and since there had been no prearranged plans for border mobilization, 100,000 inexperienced men suddenly there needed to be trained. So the regular hmm. army was stripped of officers to do so. The red tape was colossal. And I love this quote. See? Y'all fucking saying, you don't know shit about U.S. military history. U.S. military is fucking incompetent, man. Like, the only point in time where the U.S. military has genuinely been a competent fighting force is when it's been shooting itself in the Civil War, and World War II, and the Gulf War. Uh, well, really, post-World War II, USA has actually been a competent, largely competent military fighting force because of its ability with its sheer capability of being able to keep so many troops supplied without even having... Uh, the economy focused on, you know, war, right? Like, that's, that is the strength of the USA in the modern times, is that it is uh, able to do so much without even needing to, like, change anything in the economy towards a war effort. Um, yeah, supply and logistics, USA is good at that. Uh, this early sign of them realizing that they need to get good at about the staggering problems with requisition forms just to get basic equipment there was not only a shortage of blank forms but a shortage of the forms needed to requisition the blank forms the national guard blamed the army for all the shortages and the army blamed congress let's not even get into the overload I mean, yeah, issues for the blaming congress is just it's probably the correct choice. Railways that had to move all the men and the economic issues at the border once 100,000 men arrived in border towns. Still, by Christmas, 156,414 guardsmen had been transported to the border, even though three quarters of them were untrained men led by officers of limited experience. And reports like one in the excellent book, The Great Call Up, read like this. Under most favorable conditions, the regiment might be made available for field service against an inferior enemy in six months. Against trained troops, it will require two years. You can see why the Central Powers were not especially worried about American intervention if they could bring the war to a conclusion in 1917. Thing is, America learned a lot from the Great Call-Up. The mobilization problems were all highlighted on display, including things like the Army's reliance on animals instead of cars and trucks, and steps were made to correct all of this mess. So the period from June 1916 to now was one of intense training and troubleshooting. Why it's important here is that it really what the fuck? <laughs> served as a dress rehearsal for American mobilization. The Great Call-Up transformed the National Guard into a much more effective fighting force for it was as close as the United States came to the large-scale military maneuvers in which European armies traditionally engaged. The idea that the U.S. would join the war was, for Germany, offset by the news from Russia, where things looked bad militarily as well as politically. British military attaché Colonel Knox had sent London a note saying that a million men had been killed, Two million were either missing, dead, or prisoners. Half a million were in hospital. A million and a half more were on leave or had been excused from more service. And another million had deserted. Knox said that the number of troops at the front was not enough to continue the war as it was. 
But that's how things stood at the end of the week. The British on mm. the move in Mesopotamia, the Russians in Persia, rebel success in the Balkans, chaos in Petrograd, and the U.S. saying yet again that it would remain neutral. Armed neutrality. So ships could defend themselves from the U-boat menace. But that's not neutral, is it? The Germans sinking ships... That's what I was saying last week. ...with American civilians aboard is an act of war. American civilians firing on German subs is an act of war. You can mm -hmm. get as technical with the terminology as you like, but that is war. And how long... That's what I was saying last week. Well, or four days ago. ...do you think the American public would put up with reading about drowned American civilians? And how long would the Russians put up with starvation and intolerable working conditions? I'm going to guess not very long. If you want to learn... And that was the Russian February Revolution 1917. The Great War Week 137. It's begun. Um, got nothing to add here at the end. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.